passionate in what you're doing. This rings true because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, and if you're not having fun doing it, you're gonna give up. Welcome to another episode of John's Entitled Podcast, a partner of MoshPickNation.com. This episode's guest is John Siebels, the guitar player for Eve 6. And joining me for this episode, as always, is Mr. Daniel Terry. How are you doing this this afternoon, evening? I am fantastic. I am four and a half space dusts in. So we're talking beer already. Absolutely. Okay. Well, you did say in an episode previously that Space Dust basically would be your, if you were known for a beer, if it was your, I don't remember how you put it. I, don't, I want to say theme song, but that's wrong. I said it was my signature beer. My theme song is Return of the Mac by <laughs> Mark Morrison. That's right. That's right. Uh, well, you know, if we're going to go on beer thing, because I think basically you already kind of described your your beer, uh, Space Dust, last uh, one of the last couple episodes. Um, tonight I am just going with a trusty standby, uh, which I think is a really good, uh, beer to kind of talk about our guest. I have hams. It's, it's just a good go-to beer when you know you want to have a good time. And I honestly think that's kind of what Eve six kind of is like when you're ready to just have a good time, throw on some tunes and kind of feel a little bit nostalgic. It's always going to be there for you. Just like hams is dude. Not a little bit nostalgic. It is like the ultimate nostalgic. How old were you in 1998? Oh, fuck. Are you going to make me do math right now? <laughs> we just did this interview, and I drank five or four and a half space dusts. Well, you have a half a um, space dust to, to help you get to that math. Oh, Jesus. Okay, hold on. We're going to do the fucking math right here on the podcast, live. All right. All right. Okay. So um, I'm going to pull up a calculator because I'm that kind of guy. Uh-huh. And let's see here. Do I have a calculator app on my MacBook? I'm pretty sure I do. Yeah, you should just have one on your phone. Anyway, for those, uh, while Dan's trying to figure out the math of how old he is, I'll just say this. I'm 34 now. I was 14 when this record came out, and I had just moved to Michigan two years prior. So uh, growing up a product of MTV and so forth, uh, and just kind of radio at that point, having a, a Walkman and a Discman as well. I was, Dan, I don't want you to be fooled by the rocks that I got, but uh, I was... Good enough to have both a Discman, a Sony Discman, with the 10 sec- 30 second anti skip shock. Uh, and I had a Walkman, too, that I also used to play and listen to the radio and my cassettes. But uh, yeah, Eve 6, 1998. I was, uh, I was 14. Hadn't quite gone into high school. I was 13. There you go. So you would have been in what, seventh grade? Something like that. I yeah. remember watching uh, VH1's Top 20. <laughs> and that was the first time I saw the video for Inside Out, and I remember being like, "These guys are like really young, like not as young as I am, but it, young." It's funny you mention that because you mentioned it in our chat with John. And the thing that I thought was the most funny about that is I had the exact opposite approach, where I was like, "Oh, these guys look like they're in their mid twenties." Like that's the that's the time frame when when bands uh, get popular and successful is when you're in your mid twenties because you've been doing it for a while, and it it takes you know, a lot of time and dedication to your craft. Yeah, it does. I mean, (laughs) what's funny is that, so my big sister got me into like alternative and harder music. Like I got into alternative music first Mm -hmm. because that's what she liked. Most people have like a big brother that likes the music that shapes what kind of music they like. But in my case, it was my big sister and she got me really into uh, bands like Eve six and um like fastball and local h and stuff like that and so she was like a big like proponent of like you should listen to this kind of music it's different than what mom and dad like (laughs) and uh so i mean me at like 12 13 years old eve six was my shit man all that aside, there's just a, a lot of nostalgia attached to uh, the Eve 6 record. Uh, Dan and I have been commenting back and forth uh, leading up to this chat, uh, just kind of you know reminiscing about this time frame, who we were as people. Uh, and I think this is kind of an integral part of, of both of our musical journeys growing up, uh, where we both – I can't speak for Dan specifically, but I would say like this is where I started to kind of – 
getting into more alternative, more hard rock, guitar-driven stuff, you know, this is this is when follow the follow the leader came out this is where you know you're seeing a lot of the new metal bands coming out and i definitely was inspired by a lot of those bands but i was equally on the other side and listening to bands like eve six so it's always been one of those things for me as a musician where i'm somewhere between you know follow the leader and eve six i don't know what that makes me but but no i remember like when eve six was a big deal like and i know that sounds like really condescending i don't mean it to but, uh, you know, I remember when this record came out and like I said, I wasn't listening to like any of the metal shit that I listen to now, you know, all that came later, but, um, this was definitely one of the first songs that I used to get really excited about when I would hear, which I'm talking about inside out the, the biggest single off the record. And even, uh, when they released, uh, leech, that was a pretty cool song too. And they had a video for that one too. And I just, uh, I remember thinking Eve Six was like I was like, Oh my god. I could listen to this kind of shit forever. And that turned out to not be true, but like even then I still get like really heavy nostalgic vibes from that record. And uh, especially with me and John listening to it this week and talking about it and comparing notes and stuff, you know, it definitely um it was kind of a cool precursor to like he said in the interview of how all these younger bands kind of came out after that, like good Charlotte and stuff and started playing kind of a similar style, you know, in a lot of ways, Eve six kind of paved the way for, you know, kind of the pop punk bands that were going to come along later on, even though I think they were still rooted more heavily in like alternative rock. No, for sure. Uh, I think something we both have kind of commented on is that it sounds like what would become later green day. Like, as far as some of the the arrangements and and the the vocals, I I don't know the vocals, but just kind of the arrangements themselves. And it's kind of funny because we were kind of both going like, oh, it kind of sounds like American Idiot, which wasn't out for another, what, three years? So it almost, like you were saying, it it was, it predates a lot of what would become this sound. And, And sometimes, you know, the thing that's interesting to think back on is, you know, when in the day and age of, you know, I'll go off of what Alex from a tree you said recently. Oh, you know, we invented metalcore, and then it sparked this whole who invented metalcore and where did it come from and all this kind of stuff. Well, it's, I did, John. Right. And you said that the me. last time. Yes. So thank you for yeah. your contributions and all the sacrifices you made being the pioneer. Uh, no problem. No problem. I mean, that's what I'm here for. But it's kind of funny thinking back to the fact that Eve 6 kind of had a sound that wasn't really – you weren't really hearing it anywhere. And then it's like once they kind of came out, now you're kind of hearing it a lot more from other bands. So it's it's one of those where it's kind of interesting looking back at it now 20 years later, thinking back to really the significance that Eve 6 kind of played on the alternative you know, rock scene. And we've talked a lot about uh, our upcoming conversation with John. So how about we just get right to it? This is our conversation. Yes, Dan and I both talked to John. So this is our conversation with John from Eve 6, and we will talk to you afterwards. So we have the pleasure this early evening of talking to John Siebels, a guitarist for Eve Six, who are currently out on their self-titled 20-year anniversary tour. How are you doing? I know you're in uh, Utah right now, actually. Doing great. Yeah, first uh, first night of the tour tonight. Um, it's cold, but everything is good. Uh, it's going to get a lot colder when you're here in Grand Rapids in uh, about a week. Hi. <laughs> right. I know, I know. We're from L.A., so we've been used to, like, the 80s for the past two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> when I was out in L.A. Uh, earlier this year, everyone, it was almost like going back to the East Coast living here in the mid- from living here in the Midwest where, uh, you know, I would go out there and wear, like, maybe a hoodie and cut off jeans or something, and everyone's like, aren't you freezing? And it's like, no, bitch, like, <laughs> this is, like, 70, deg- 70 degrees is just, like, normal weather. Like, that's, like, summer, like, heat heat wave for me. Yeah, totally. But I got a lot of looks out in L.A. while I was out there. Like People are like, aren't you freezing? We have our jackets on. It's like, it's 76 degrees. Oh, yeah, if it degrees. drops below. <laughs> yeah, 
if it if it drops below sixty, people have like full jackets, scarves, beanies. You know, it's like that. That's freezing. Yeah, it's, it's like shut down the highway for for a half inch of snow. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, if we got if we got snow, it would be all over. Oh, you know, it's funny because like I know, like I said, growing up uh, in the East Coast from Delaware, I know we'd get like a half inch, and it, the whole state would shut down. And when I moved out here to right. Michigan, the first snow we got, like a good amount of snow, I remember being like, oh, yeah, fucking no school. And my dad's like, no, start walking. <laughs> so it's like I can't imagine like how like the city of L.A. or whatever would just completely shut down. Yeah, we get a little rain and it shuts down. <laughs> the, lo- the, lo- the-, the local news starts talking about, about Stormwatch, you know. But that's funny. So, oh, you know, 20 years of the, the self-titled record, you know, I kind of wanted to focus on that a little bit. You know, let's, cool. I guess, start at the very beginning. You know, you guys, you know, the last record you guys put out, Speaking Code, came out in 2012. We're, you know, six years removed from that at this point. So what made you guys yep. decide to go for the 20-year anniversary tour? Um, We wanted to do something. Um, our uh, Our booking agent had kind of originally talked to us about doing something over the summer. Um... But, uh, you know, Max has his new project, Fitness, and I have a management company. I manage a bunch of artists, and, you know, we've kind of got a lot going on. So um, we just couldn't really make that happen. And uh, so then we were like, well, let you know, let's at least do something at the end of the year. We were going to do a couple of, you know, long weekends, and it sort of just turned into uh, into a, a two-week tour, basically. So, um yeah, you know, we, we wanted to do something, um, and this was this was what we could pull out in the uh, in the final hour, basically. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of surprised. You know, that it is very <laughs> very under the the deadline there of getting it in in uh, 2018. You know, what are some of the memories you have of recording this record? Man, um, I mean, it, it, it's it was such a different time. I mean, we literally graduated high school, um, you know, in 97, uh, and went into the studio that summer to make the record. Um, so, I mean, I have, you know, really fond memories of, of the recording of that record. Cause it was just, it was what we did every single day. Um, you know, there was no, no worries, <laughs> you know, no, no real responsibilities to, to speak of. And, um, uh, we, we were just, you know, doing, doing what we wanted to do, which was, which was incredible. I'm sure our parents were scared to death that we were, um, spending our time making an album and not thinking about our future, but, um, you know, uh, it worked out, I guess. So it's all good, (laughs) but, um, um, but yeah, it was just a, it was a really great time. We went at, 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 towards the end of the record. Um, we went to New York to like mix a couple of the songs, uh, which is where our label was at the time. It was the first time I've been in New York. Um, and, uh, you know, we got to work in electric lady studios out there <clears throat> and, um, it was just, yeah, it was just, all, you know, all these things that were that that were new and exciting and and fresh and uh it was it was definitely great days you know yeah i guess the the with it being uh with it being essentially a, a first album was that uh were there like independent releases prior to that i've always, i've been always wondering that but back in 1998 yeah. i was wondering that you know <laughs> yeah yeah totally so <laughs> what we did was i mean we had a few like demos you know we kind of like you know, sort of a morphing of, of the band, you know, throughout high school, basically, or a couple of different names. But at the, at, so, but once the time, or once the, uh, at the point where we signed our, our deal with RCA, um, we were still, I think, juniors in high school at that point. So oh, wow. we were like, all right, cool. We're dropping, we're dropping out of school. We're going to do this. And our A&R guy was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> like, that's not going to happen. Um, and, you know, finish high school. You don't want to go on the road with your parents. You need to develop a little more and, all that, which was incredible, especially at that time to have, you know, someone that, that actually cared that much <laughs> in the music business to, to not just like chew us up and spit us out, you know, like to give us that opportunity to develop was awesome. So we made an EP, uh, our band was called 11 teen at that point. Um, <laughs> we made an EP, <laughs> we, we made an EP, 
Um, it never got distributed. There were some CDs made, you know, um, the hardcores have gotten their hands on them, uh, along the way. Um, but they, it was sort of like, you know, we took, we took money that was, you know, like basically the label gave us some money and we're just like, do, do whatever you want to do until, you know, until it's time to make a real record. So we made an EP and we played shows and, and, um, bought some gear and all that. But so the first record was really our first official release, but you know, we had recorded stuff previous. I just got to say 11 teen. The only reason I laughed is because I was thinking of, uh, the, the movie Haggard, that Bam Margera movie that he self put out. And in it, uh, I, don't, a, I haven't seen it. Oh my God. There's a scene where they're talking about this competition and Bam's character was like, fuck that. That's for 11 teen year olds. <laughs> and just the absurdity of the the fact of calling someone an eleven teen year old is just very amusing to me. Right. So the fact that yeah, I yeah. didn't know that your band was called eleven teen. <laughs> yeah, we we thought we were pretty funny back in high school. I mean, Tur- turns out we weren't. I think that's when everyone <laughs> is their funniest, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny that you guys were that young because I remember seeing the uh, video for Inside Out on uh, VH1, and I was remember thinking, I was like, man. These guys have got to be like mid twenties, fifteen, six. No, dude, I yeah, thought younger yeah. than that, man. Like, oh, yeah. I, like you know, because in ninety eight, I was obviously younger than that, even. But like, I remember thinking, like, wow, these guys are really young. Maybe that means that you know, uh, if I start a band, I can, you know. So it was kind of cool <laughs> to see that hey, I did yeah. start a band. It did not have a, a massively huge single on it, though. <laughs> <laughs> You no, know, I mean, you know, it, it kind of, it definitely led, you know, to a lot of other, you know, sort of younger bands. I mean, at, at the time when we came out, it was, it was, you know, the, the guys that were at least like in the alternative bands were definitely, you know, older than us. And, uh, and then, you know, all of a sudden it was like good Charlotte and, you know, all these bands that, that, that were our age basically. So, you know, it, it, it was actually, it was cool, you know. Were you surprised at how instantly successful or how instantly it caught on the sing- the single of Inside Out landed for you guys? Yes, yes and no. I mean, like I I knew enough to know that it was a huge deal and that no matter how quick it happened, whether it was fast or slow, that you know that that put us in a a certain percentile of 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 artists that, you know, um, so we definitely knew that. Um, but then I think there's also another side of it where you're like, all of a sudden you start to be like, Oh wow, we really are that good, <laughs> you know? And, um, I always tell my artists that I work with now, like never believe you're as good as people tell you you are because <laughs> that's when it'll just fuck ever fuck everything up. You know what I mean? Right. right. Um, but so, so it definitely, you know, we, we definitely, lost our uh undeveloped minds uh quite a bit but um but i think you know we also understood what it meant you know so i i guess that's a yes and a no yeah i think that uh i think it's interesting too because you know a lot of us you know like i've probably been in like five six bands or whatever so like that feeling of like oh my god i'm putting out my first official release and now it's gotten huge and now we're gonna go play all these places and do all these appearances, you know, what is, what is that like on a young mind? I mean, is it just like, is it confirmation of what you expected to happen or was this like a total surprise? Um, I think it was a surprise, but then once it happened, we lost our minds for sure. Like gotcha. they were, they were fully gone for, uh, for a while, you know, I mean, we still worked hard, but we also, we also lost our, lost our pretty little minds for sure. <laughs> You know something I, I've kind of <laughs> something I've kind of focused on on this podcast a little bit, getting to talk to a lot of bands that were kind of striking it big in the early, the middle to late '90s and early 2000s when I was kind of you know going through high school and so forth. Something uh-huh. that is interesting is to think about how, and you had kind of spoken to the fact that you were pretty much right out of high school when this happened, is thinking about how young you are, and now all of a sudden a label is looking at you to be a product to make pretty i would say grown people decisions and and looking at Mm -hmm. you to know your finances your the business side of the music industry basically 
looking back now, you know, 20 years later, do you think – is it kind of interesting to kind of go back and look at all of the things that you kind of were responsible for or, or the things that maybe happened that you kind of had to deal with all for the first time and just kind of be like, wow, like no <laughs> no high school graduate like coming right out of high school really should have to deal with all this shit. Like, you know, like how you were saying like someone – your A&R dude basically was like, hey, look, graduate high school, get that at least under your belt and then let's kind of right. get this thing going. Is it kind of surprising at such a young age, like what the music industry is willing to kind of put three young people through? Um, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, we were super lucky to have uh, incredible management at the time. Stu Sobel, God rest his soul, uh, was, you know, he was definitely, he cared about us, uh, you know, like, you know, as people. Um, and so, I think we got really lucky there, but yeah, I mean, the industry, you know, uh, it, it, they definitely, you know, they chew you up and, and spit you out for sure. Um, uh, and then especially, at, you know, as the industry changed, it, you know, when I really started to notice it was kind of between records two and three, when, you know, Download. everything changed now downloading, all the labels started to merge, you know, all of a sudden we're heading into our third record and the president of the label is different. The, the, you know, the, um, everything's different, you know, and, and those people definitely did not care about us. Like the people who broke us, you know? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, the, the sort of, um, you know, the fleeting aspect of it became very real. Um, you know, I, I don't think like I don't feel like anyone took advantage of us. You know, I don't feel like anyone, you know, hey, I mean, people fucked us over here and there, but that's that's life. Um, but um, but yeah, it was it was still crazy to deal with at a young age. And I wish I knew then what I know now for sure. But I mean, <laughs> again, that's that's just life. <laughs> you know, I think yeah. I think everyone can can relate to that in one way or another you know? yeah if you were if you were a plumber you would have a similar experience yeah <laughs> so totally totally as far as the tour goes with it being the 20th anniversary you know is is this going to be just a straight you guys show up and play the self-titled album beginning to end or is it um is it going to be expanded out on that or um we're we're gonna uh play the whole first record uh in order so we're playing inside out second which is kind of funny um uh, but, uh, yeah, we're going to play the whole first record in order, do a little break and then we'll play, you know, uh, some of the, uh, you know, think twice and, uh, promise and, you know, some of the other, uh, usual suspects, um, to, to finish it out. So, um, so yeah, that's sort of the, the, the plan. Kind of piggybacking off of Dan's thing. Cause you know, I've had the the pleasure of actually seeing a lot of these anniversary tours in the last handful of years, I guess the byproduct of getting older. <laughs> um, yep. But it's been interesting to see how everyone handles it differently. Like, you know, Korn, when I went and saw them on the 28 year anniversary of the self-titled or yeah, the self-titled record, um, you know, they did it front to back, even had all like the little skits and stuff in, in the spots where they were, but then, you know, going to see a right. band like unearth, they did something that was pretty interesting, which is they, made a set where they yes they played the entire record but they didn't play it in order right. they kind of made a set based on their record and so it's been kind of interesting to see how bands tackle this whether they actually play it front to back legitimately like the statement would seem or if they kind of go all right let's look at these 10 to 11 songs and, and build a set based on this with ebbs and flows and so forth and you know maybe do an encore of you know yeah. whatever you know the the other hits and so forth so I, you know it's it's funny to to see how bands kind of decide how they're going to actually do these anniversary things. Yeah, I think the way that we look at it is that, you know, at that time, you know, it was CDs, you know, and right. and and so you, we really focused on on the um on the sequencing of the album, you know, it wasn't like now where people just put out like single 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 and then it kind of turns into a record and um, it's, it, you know, we, we really took a lot of time to make the A side and the B side, if you will. And, and, you know, and sequence it like we, we thought it should go. So I feel like, 
you know, it just sort of made sense to do it in order, uh, you know, given that sort of philosophy of like, you know, how, how we, how we sequence the album in the first place. And I like playing inside out second. Cause we always play it last because of course, <laughs> you know, we always play it last. So <laughs> it's going to be something different, which is what also what we want to do is something different from our normal set, you know? I was actually just going to ask, speaking of, you know, an A-side and a B-side, if you guys had put out the record on vinyl, but I do see that as of two years ago, you re-released a, uh, it on vinyl or the, the we label did. did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we did. Um, this really cool uh, company called War God Collective um, has been doing a lot of these reissues. So they did our first record and second record, actually. And then um, we just did another uh, limited edition run for the tour as well. So we've got like 300 so you're gonna limited have, edition, you're like gonna have a tour bloodshot variant. vinyl. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Ooh, I might it's, have to pick that you up. You know, it's not like su- super different, but it's uh, it's cool. We did this like bloodshot vinyl and... Uh, uh, it's, it's awesome. Cause the record never came out on vinyl in the first place. So, no. um, and, and I love vinyl, so it's, it's, it's cool to, to be able to do it now. So is that something that, you know, is kind of mind blowing now that, you know, I mean, back whenever this record came out, people were kind of moving away from cassettes from vinyl and stuff like that. So to see it, to see it released now on vinyl, um, does that, does that kind of blow your mind a little bit that like indicative of the time period, everybody was moving away from it, but now everybody wants it. Everybody wants that format. Yeah. I mean, I've always, you know, I would always go and dig through crates at the, at the record store and try to find cool vinyls, you know? So I was always a a fan of it, you know, listen to old punk rock, you know, listen to operation Ivy or, you know, whatever on vinyl was like the best to me as a kid. So I've always, you know, had an affinity for it. And, um, and it makes sense now because it's like, you don't need, you know, it's the best thing for like a collector, you know, it's like, obviously you can just go on Spotify and listen, listen to music, anything you want. Um, so a CD doesn't make sense anymore. Cassette tapes, like, you know, they sound like shit. I mean, it's cool. Like, uh, you know, the punk bands are putting out like limited edition cassette tapes now, even, which is kind of fun or whatever. But, um, but to me, vinyl just makes sense as a, an actual physical format because, you actually get to see the artwork and um, and you know touch it and and have it on your you know uh, have it on your shelf and 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 it sounds cool you know so it totally makes sense that if any physical format were going to survive it would be that or come back even you know yeah most definitely I was kind of surprised in looking back you know going through the discography in the last couple of days leading up to this chat. I was I didn't remember that horoscopes was such a quick follow up. I thought there was a two year. I mean, because that's that's a typical release tour cycle. You know, drop an album tour it for about a year, year and a half to do another one. So usually it's an every two to three year kind of thing. So was right. the was the follow up because you guys had so much material going into the self titled that it was easy to follow it up, or was it more of a a label wanting to strike while the iron was hot with Inside Out being a big single? I think it was the the latter. Um, I mean, a, a few of those ideas we had um, kind of kicking around, um, but but most of that record we wrote, you know, we'd kind of go into the studio with an idea and, and flush it out in the studio. Um, I think that uh, it was, it, you know, it was management, our, our management and the label, both knowing that, you know, we shouldn't wait five years. Um, and also, um, you know, it was interesting because the, the first record and second record were produced by Don Gilmore. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first, the first record, uh, I mean, he had done a few things, you know, um, but nothing, nothing breakout. And so that was Hybrid basically theory. like the breakout. <laughs> well, that came well, after. He came after so... Horace Ghost, but I was going to say, like, that was the thing when I looked at the record and the, the track listing and all that, I was like, oh, Don Gilmore produced this. I wonder how close right. this was to hybrid theory. <laughs> and then so it was like it the was, first two and then after. basically, yeah. 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 So, so, so basically between, um, you know, the first record where he hadn't done, I mean, you know, he had done cool shit. Like he had, he had, he'd done a lot of engineering on like Pearl Jam records and, mm-hmm. you know, he was kind of in that Seattle scene, but as an actual producer, uh, Inside Out was his first hit. So cut to two years later, he had done Lit and he had done Good Charlotte and he had done, 
Lincoln Park and, and, and all this stuff. So, you know, um, I think that it was sort of like, um, I mean, he was on a fucking roll at that point. He was our guy. Um, so I think that was what made it possible to like go in and, and, and really just like get it done. Um, you know, rather than like trying to find a new producer and, you know, um, work through all those sort of kinks. It was like, um, you know, it, it just sort of like, we just went in and did it, you know, we knew each other. We were, we were both sort of on this, um, you know, sort of breakout <laughs> scenario and, uh, and it just, it just, we just went in and did it, you know? Yeah, it was, it was kind of interesting. Cause it's, it's sometimes fun in doing these chats, uh, looking at the producers and the people associated with the record and then kind of being like, oh man, this is right before even this producer just fucking made a name for themselves and blew up. And in addition to the band and the bands, like, you know, you mentioned lit, I think he, I think it was a uh, place in the sun, which obviously broke them. Uh, 2000, I think was, yep. uh, Lincoln Park hybrid theory, like just the sheer yep. records that this dude did that were like that Don did that, like had such an impact on that that time stamp or that time frame is just kind of incredible to see like started with you guys and then just kind of kept rolling. Yeah. He was literally on that first record. Like he was literally staying at like our manager's friend's apartment in like a shitty area of Hollywood, <laughs> you know, and, we, and like, you, you know, like we were, you know, just, you know, skimping to get it done. And then two years later, we had NRG locked out and we were, you know, with drum techs and runners and, and the whole thing. So it was, it was a pretty crazy, uh, uh, pretty crazy time really. That's awesome. Well, you know, we're not, we're not that far off from, uh, 2020. Are we looking at maybe a horoscope? Actually, it'd just be next year, uh, 2019 reunion show. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, probably, um, we haven't really, thought that far ahead um obviously we don't think ahead and that's why we did a tour at the last minute of this year but um <laughs> hey it still counts it still it still fucking counts okay <laughs> it's, yeah totally so um but yeah i think it would be cool to do something you know but uh nothing nothing's on the books yet <laughs> you should just roll right from this tour into the next one i know i know well we've still got a year so uh we got it we got a couple ideas of little things you know we're gonna we're gonna work on next year but um yeah we'll see what happens so um as far as a couple other things is there currently plans for anything new to come out you know um <clears throat> right now n no um we have like like i said we kind of have a few little ideas of like um we've always wanted to do like a punk rock covers album and like cover all the songs that were like you know, the, the influential songs to us, um, when we were kids. Um, cool. so we might do, do, do something fun like that. We might do a single, um, you know, I think, I think at this point, you know, again, we're focused on other stuff. Max has got his band. I've got a management company. Um, and you know, so it's like, we don't necessarily want to do at the moment anyways, like, an album and a year's worth of touring for it. Um, but, sure. but, but, but on the same hand, you know, so I, I guess point being like anything that we do right now is going to be strictly for our fan base. You know, like we're not trying to, we're not trying to like break a new single at radio right now. You know, it's, it, it would be, it would be strictly for those people that have, have been there for, for 20 years and still care. Um, and whatever happened beyond that would be, would just be icing. But, but, um, so, you know, we might do a single, we might do this covers album, um, or, or at least EP, you know, stuff that's fun for us that, that people will dig. But, um, you know, again, without, without trying to do a full, uh, like album cycle promotion, I, I don't think, I think with everything else we've got going on, uh, that just wouldn't really, really make sense right now. Sure, I understand. And, you know, honestly, in in this day and age, even if it ended up just being one single, that's kind of the way everybody's mm -hmm. going anyway as far as releasing content. Because it's one of those things yeah. where it doesn't make sense to record a full album, 
release a single off of that album, hope it tracks, hope it does well. You know, if you right. if you throw a single out, then you already know all that information. And then if the single does well enough for you to be like, you know what, I think people are really clamoring for this. It helps you make a game plan better, I think, than just kind of shooting in the dark, which is what yeah. kind of the industry had, had been doing for years at that point. Right, right. And and also just the time involved to get to that point. It's like to make a whole album, you know, and then and then release it and and tour behind it and and doing all that. It's you know, you're talking about a couple of years of stuff and uh yeah, and like you say just to not even know what's really going to happen, <laughs> you know, is is uh is tough. Um and and again, honestly, the only thing we care about at this point when it comes to Eve six are our fans, you know? So it's like, it, we would be doing it for them not to try to like break a song at an alternative radio. Cause Hey, maybe it could happen, but it's not, it's just not our focus, you know? Right. Kind of in wrapping up. Um, what is your favorite song off to play off of this, uh, this upcoming or off of the self-titled record that maybe you didn't get to play even back when it first came out? Yeah, we had to learn about half the record because uh, <laughs> we haven't ha- hadn't played hadn't played about five of those songs in probably 19 years. You know, right. um, uh, the 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 uh, the unexpected one for me was Jesus Nightlight. It was kind of our quote unquote ballad. And at, to be honest with you, like I ne- I didn't like it back in the day. Like when we <laughs> when we did that song, I was like, I don't know, but I don't know about this song. It's, it's you know seems kind of boring to me and then um and then uh, you know listening back to that stuff which i haven't listened to in years um i was like man i like this song a lot um (laughs) so (laughs) so that that one for me has been the uh sort of unexpected uh fun one um but all fun and they bring back great memories and we just try to have fun with eve six these days man it's not you know like we're we're not trying to take ourselves too seriously. We're just we're just trying to have a good time, and and you know, get out there. So it's that that's that's really it these days. Well, looking forward to uh, catching you guys next week here in Grand Rapids. Uh, maybe if you have time, we can go to Founders and, and grab a beer. Uh, we are beer for city sure, man. Yeah, as, as well, obviously. <laughs> Um, yeah, it'll uh, it'll probably have to be a non-alcoholic for me, but uh, I'm I'm down for that and down oh, for a hang. For we sure. have we have plenty of coffee houses by the venue. <laughs> there, there's one. Yeah, I swear well, to God, it looks like a it looks like a MacBook store. Like you just look in the window and you're like Mac, Mac, iPhone, iPhone, Mac, Mac. Yep. Like you're just like, oh, is this like a walking advertisement? <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I can't. Uh, in my old age, I can't. Uh, I can't handle drinking beer anymore, but uh, I'll uh, I'll drink coffee, I'll drink a non-alcoholic beer, and I'll smoke a cigar. So you know any of those things. We have a cigar bar near me. the venue too. Perfect. There Perfect. you go. I think the closest you're coming to me is in uh, Springfield on December 9th, which is okay. about three hours away. So you may see me there, you may not. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, definitely keep us posted, and you know we'll uh, we'll, we'll for hang. sure. For sure. And then, uh, where can people find you and or the band online? Um, let's see, the band online. Uh, it's uh, Eve Six at Eve Six on Twitter and Instagram. Eve Six official on Facebook. Um, John at John Siebel's on Twitter and Instagram. At Max Collins Music on Twitter and Instagram. Um, you know. That's it. But if you just find Eve Six, you can you can make your way to us. <laughs> and then I always like to end these out with a, a song. So, what would you like me to play it out to? Oh, uh, let's go. Obviously, let's go for something off the first record. Let's let's just go for how much longer the the, the, the first first track on the album. Awesome. Well, John, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us on the uh, the kickstart of the the twenty year anniversary tour. And like I said, looking forward to seeing you guys next week. Yeah, likewise, man. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely hang and uh, appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. So that was our chat with John Siebels of Eve 6. So, Dan, what did you think of that conversation? I enjoyed it, man. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I appreciated being on it. And, uh, you know, I, I think it was a lot of fun. And I think that there were some things about Eve 6 that I never knew before, like that the fact that they used to be called, what was it, 11 Eleventeen. 
Eleven teen. That's right. And uh, that's information I didn't have. And I just think it's kind of inspiring that these that this band of like sixteen, seventeen somethings fucking put out a record that was huge. Like, and I, I like how we went into how they kind of lost their minds <laughs> after that because, like, that's what I would be doing. Right. Because I mean, when you're when you're seventeen, and you're in a band, and you put out a single like Inside Out, how do you not like spend every day being like, yeah, here's the thing though, I'm the shit. How do you not have that mindset? Um, all that aside, no, it was really fun talking with John. Um, you know, it's it's kind of it's it's bittersweet, you know, seeing all these these albums that you grew up with turning, you know, 10, 15, 20 years old. Uh Hatebreed as of the day that we were recording this just announced the uh 25 year anniversary tour of Hatebreed where they have Cro-Mags, Terror, Obituary, just Jesus Christ. Like those are all legacy bands, but I mean it's like to think that you've been listening to some of these bands as long as they've been around or an album has is as old as it is. It just kind of makes you feel old. Um, but I think that's kind of the fun thing about going to these tours though, is, you know, for a night you can, with a bunch of your friends, maybe that you may still be in contact with from that, that era can relive a little bit of your youth one night at a time, I guess. And I feel like for a band, that would probably be really cool to, to go out and, you know, maybe I'll talk to John a little bit about this more, uh, when I see the band, uh, next week, but I think it'd be kind of interesting to just kind of to to see people reliving their youth at your show in the in a, in celebration of like your your first record, and I feel like that's kind of got to be an interesting perspective to have. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, honestly, like I hadn't been following Eve Six that much over time, but I really enjoyed I really enjoyed his thoughts and just the the perspective that goes behind it because like 1998 was a vastly different time than. 2018 obviously i'm not just talking about years but like just the way the music industry is shaped and how differently it works now like i just i found all that very interesting you know like his perspective actually living through it versus whatever just my subjective uh you know thoughts on what i think it might have been like (laughs) so uh i i I don't know i thought it was pretty eye-opening and pretty cool yeah it's uh, it's always kind of weird because sometimes you hear these interviews with people who are, you know, on other podcasts or doing interviews with people, and sometimes it feels like either the band isn't really wanting to do this because they want to focus on doing something new. But it it was really refreshing hearing John basically just kind of be like, "Well, we're not really doing a whole lot right now, and you know, we're like Max is busy doing other stuff, and and I have a you know management company, and we just want to have fun. And it's like at the end of the day, isn't that the whole point of being in a band and, and going to tour? Is that you do this for for the love of the craft, basically? And so to kind of do a twenty anniversary tour, a lot of times it, it isn't. I don't really feel like it's for the band at all. I feel like it's for their fans and. It's kind of, like I said, it's just refreshing to hear John be like, yeah, you know, anything we do from kind of here on out is more for our fans who have been with us for 20 years. And I think that's pretty commendable. Um, Yeah, I thought it was commendable how he uh, was like, you know what, man, we we might do something new, but it's just going to be for the fans. Yeah. It's just going to be for the people that come out to see us on this tour. And I think that's really cool. I think that, you know, it's a realistic take on where Eve 6 is in 2018. No, most definitely. The other thing, too, that I thought was kind of interesting is thinking about how, to me, seeing a lot of bands put their biggest hit off of a record at the very end to keep people there. And, you know, John's like, yeah, we're playing (laughs) we're playing Inside Out second where it is on the record. And it's like that's kind of a a big gamble because, like, I would as a band that hasn't put anything out in six years and and hasn't really toured or anything, I would almost be like if we play our biggest hit, people are going to leave. Like, that would be my fear. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that I think the diehards are the ones that are going to be at this tour. No, for sure. Yeah. And I think that they're going to want to hear the whole record. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. I'm uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing this uh, this show and uh, kind of reliving, you know, 1998. Uh, 
you know, I wasn't married when this record came out. I wasn't old enough to drink beer legally when this came out. Uh, so it'll be uh, it'll be interesting uh, to kind of to, to relive this this era uh, with a bunch of strangers in a in a venue. And if you would like to keep up with Eve Six and kind of follow them along on this nostalgia tour, uh, you can find them on Instagram and Twitter at Eve Six. And you can find them on Facebook at Eve Six Official. If you would like to keep up with John, you can find him on Twitter and Instagram under his name, John Siebels, S I E B E L S. Simple enough. And uh, Dan, where can people find you? You can find me on Facebook at Daniel Terry. You can find me on Twitter at Discuss Metal Dan. You can find my other podcast, Discography Discussion, at DiscussMetal.com. So if you can't find me at that point, it's your fault. It's true. And if you would like to keep up with all things the podcast, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at John's Entitled Podcast. Tweet at us at John's Entitled Pod. Email us at John's Entitled Pod at gmail.com. And we are going to end this episode as we always do with a song. And as you heard John say, he wanted us to play it out to Eve Six's first track off of their self titled debut, How Much Longer. So we're going to play it out to that, and we will talk to you guys next time.